Okay. I'm not sure. Can you guys hear me okay? I'm known to speak. Okay, my mom's here, so I have to speak extra loud. Okay. Um, first of all, um, thank you to Maurice again, who, as he mentioned, some of you weren't in the room. He spoke before the film. He came two and a half hours just to come and be able to watch this in a room with all of you and, and share some words. So I just want to say thank you again uh, for doing so. And first of all, thank you to our panelists who are up here. I'm just going to introduce everyone quickly, share a little bit uh, of background, and then uh, we'll head into the questions. But all the way to my right, your left, we have Joe Teplow. Um, I think many titles to your name, but of one Nova Exhibit co-creator, um, which many of you, I hope, have done a good job. We have Avi Hamra, who I'm sure as well wears many hats, but uh, in this hat for today, you're a very strong, proud Syrian Jewish activist. Thank you for all that you do and continue to do. We have Rabbi Ragamov, COO of Chazak, and also has, uh, I know, years of experience on college campus, and you know, I'm sure we'll share a few words about that um, and what, what he brings to the table today. And last but definitely not least, Eli Kohanim, former USW envoy to combat anti-Semitism. Um, I feel like we've known each other. We only got to speak for the first time yesterday, but uh, through a, a long-winded way, we've, I think, met in, the, in other places and other times. And uh, if you haven't seen all she's done to speak out for the Jewish people, not just since October 7th, but for years before, you should really check it out. And we're very fortunate to be able to hear a few words from her today. So thank you all. I just really quickly want to do a time check. We have till, till when? I'll watch the clock. 7.20. Okay. So I, I do... Okay. So, first of all, I just want to give like a little bit of extra context behind the film. I didn't know what to do before or after. People often ask me, how did you get involved? And I think it's an important part of all of our stories sitting here. I personally always had a dream to make a film. Um, I don't know why, but I did for years now. If anyone... If close friend or family were in this room knows, I mentioned at some point or another that I wanted to make a documentary. I didn't know why, I didn't know how it would happen, I thought it would be about Israel. Um, and I would do random things to make that happen. I would do random interviews, I had a podcast. Um, and actually in September, I made a decision that I was going to make a film. I was going to leave my job at some point and I was going to make a film. And uh, when October 7th happened, everything kind of fell upside down for all of us. And I said, the last thing I'm going to do right now is make a film. Um, and I paused, and I got some feedback from other people. I said, no, for, this is the time. Like, people need to hear whatever story it is that's going to come out from you. People need to hear a, sto hear a story. So I started doing interviews, uh, you know, got on social media to the small extent that I could manage to get on social media, YouTube, the like, and just really put out feelers. And I would get interviews with random people. I don't even know how. And some of those interviews in there were actually from that time. And... Long story short, I got to a point where I said, okay, maybe this isn't, you know, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing here. And exactly, I'd say it's about six weeks ago now, I got a message from a boss, uh, from, my, from my boss, Red Markowitz, who was in, uh, in that film as well. I work, just for background, with college students on college campuses dealing with anti-Semitism. That's what I've been doing for the past eight, nine months um, since coming back from Israel, and so I've been kind of in the thick of this. And they wanted to interview some of our students, and when I read the description of the film, I said, wow, that's a fascinating description. That kind of feels like what I've really, this, one of the stories I've really been wanting to tell for years. Like, I didn't, I didn't know it in this way because anti-Semitism wasn't happening the way it was and all these other things, but it kind of felt like everything came to a head. And from the time that I spoke with the producer, and I just also want to point out, we have Riva Wayman in the back over here. She always is incognito, but she's one of the very, very talented producers on the film who poured her heart and soul into this. Herself and Dee Orman, who's not here, um, but both extremely talented individuals who really poured their heart and soul into this. And just this film was, cre I, I say that it's baffling. In about a month, month and a half, they put this together. And from the time that I got in touch with the team until I was sitting in a chair doing interviews was about four days. And it was one of those moments where I just said, Hashem knows his time. 
And I, I share that backstory because I think there's a reason that we're all staring, sh sitting in this room. I don't, I don't feel like, wow, you know, so exciting that I have a film. I, I feel like there's a purpose and there's a mission behind this and there's a mission behind what each of us are doing right now with our lives or wherever we are. And we have to take that, we have an achrayas, so we have a responsibility to do something with it. So I hope that sitting here and hearing from these amazing individuals really pushes you forward to do something and to realize that what you were watching here, I don't know if you guys pay attention, you know, like the dates were April 30th, not 2000, 1995, that was April 30th, 2024. And, you know, I work in this space, I know, as well, what is in the pipeline, and it's not going away. It's not going away here, it's not going away in Israel. I mean, Mashiach should be here soon, and, you know, I don't know, time is ticking, where Tisha B'Av is over, but, but we're in it, and we have to own that we're in it, whatever that means to each of us, and it's not, you know, doesn't have to be the loudest and proudest thing, but something for you that is different. Take the words of the rabbis that you heard today, and take the words that you're going to hear from these individuals to heart, because it's in the moment, it's today. So, with my uh, lengthier than expected intro, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to ask really briefly, I know I, I mentioned whoever in here is, we'll start with Joe at the end, just if you could share anything you want, you know, the room to know about you other than your Nova exhibit title, um, and then just an anecdote about either the first time you might have experienced anti-Semitism or the most jarring experience you had. Um, first of all, I think that was remarkable. Um, crazy timeline, and thank you so much uh, for putting your heart into this for the time you did it. It's, I was watching and wondering when you snuck that into the various projects I know you're involved with, so really huge. Um, um, also, Rabbi alluded earlier to the signs upstairs that have been uh, standing there since, uh, since the 7th, and as I walked in today, not only has the community taken it upon themselves to have the signs hanging, They've taken it upon themselves to update them. Right? Every, every release, and there's only a few up there that have uh, the sign that says rescued. And um, as I walked in, I saw a picture of one of them. And somehow I have the, uh, me and a few friends have the zikhut uh, of hosting uh, the rescued hostage in my house uh, this week, Andre Kozlov. And um, he's actually just staying on 24th Street. Um, and uh, I sent him a picture. Of the of the updated poster, and he you know, sent the respective uh, GIF and emojis um, in response in the group chat. But uh, I have to show that the GIF to Rabbi. But I think that those uh, that that get to greet a brighter future are those that have the courage to pray for one and to take action towards it. And so uh, I should to the community for for that. Right? It's you know crazy, but it's kind of coincidence that we have the privilege of welcoming. Uh, people like that here. Um, I think the truth for me on, on uh, you know experience, personal experience of anti-Semitism um, is uh, in America is thank God very uh, it's very few and far between. I think the first time I remember actually being targeted, like in a, in, and feeling threatened, was the first Seba Dome I ever experienced in, in Israel. I was in um, a little mall with my grandmother and um, many years ago. And the siren alarm goes off, we run to the shelter, and it was the strangest feeling. I knew that this had happened time and time again for many years, but the first time you have to run yourself, I don't know if this resonates with anyone that's experienced it, it's like, I think the feeling as a, as a kid was, I wish you took the time to get to know me before you targeted me. It was like, you don't even know me, and here I am running, and I wanted him to know and to just meet me. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you. The film was amazing, and hearing the timeline, I'm going to double down on that comment. It is truly, truly impressive, so really a for the film, and this is my first time in the synagogue, it is beautiful, um, so really very nice to see Rabbi Farhi as well, um, and thank you for everything. Speaking Arabic. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to confuse him too much, this is Evan, but I'm going to make you out of it, this is true So I'm, I'm an attorney. Um, I am a partner at a mid-sized immigration law firm in the city, and since the year 2001, um, after the attack against Joseph Borgen, I started speaking out on my social media, just really expressing my frustrations and trying to educate the public and fight back against the anti-Semitism that I was seeing explode 
um, here today. And so I've been doing it since before October 7th, and unfortunately October 7th, it really showed us the deep hatred or the deep misinformation campaign that has been uh, propagandized against the students, against America at large. So after October 7th, things got a lot worse. Um, if I want to share my first uh, experience with anti-Semitism, i got to take you back to Damascus, Syria. <laughs> I was four years old. I was playing with a cat out, you know, outside of the yard that we called it a hosh uh, by my grandfather's house. When a Palestinian mother and her son walk by, the mother instructs her son to pick up a stone and throw it at my head. Um, he proceeds to do that. I'm obviously gushing blood. My mother runs out. They run over to the Mukhabarat. My mom runs to the Mukhabarat, which were the police force in charge of the Jewish community at the time. Um, they're really the intelligence spy agency against the Jews. Um, to report what happened to me. They came back. They saw me. They saw me bleeding. They knew who it was. The mother never denied that her son did this. She never denied that she instructed her son to do this. They looked at the son, they looked at the mother, and they said, don't do that again. It's really not a good thing to do. Don't attack the Jews. Thank you. Have a nice day. Nothing happened. Unfortunately, we're seeing the same resurfacing in the United States, and so we need to act now. Thank you. Thank you. very much for that film, that was awesome. Uh, the truth is, um, I, I got a little sneak peek preview beforehand, um, and uh, I, I, I watched the first 30 minutes, I didn't want to go through all of it, because I wanted to see somebody here with everybody else, and I was blown away. It was mamash, beautiful, and it was meaningful, and it was moving. Um, you know, I was born in Brooklyn, uh, and um, my, uh, my, my neighbors were not Jewish, um, and I have very vivid memories as a, uh, as a seven-year-old dealing with uh, kids who were my age, or not Jewish, who were calling me out as the Jew boy. Um, you know, I, um, I, I remember them chasing after me, stealing my bike. Um, I just, I remember it very vividly. I remember a lot of anti-Semitism in New York in the early 80s. Um, my closest friend growing up was Chinese, he was Catholic. And because he was Chinese and I was Jewish, we became really good friends. And uh, often we would uh, kind of like, have our own little gang of, you know, the Chinese and the Jews who would often fight with the Italians and the Hispanics in our neighborhood. Um, I never thought at all I would ever have to, you know, uh, I never, I never believed that I'd live in a world in America where we'd be having conversations like this about anti-Semitism and the way in which it's being expressed uh, in society today. Um, I spent much of my time over the last 20 years on campus and working with young people. I could say that uh, when my wife and I got married, we came back to America to work on campus. That was in 2002. Um, you know, you saw a lot of interesting, you know, developments happening on campus with a uh, new organizations like SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine, and so on and so forth. But one telling, you know, story I'll share with you is that you know, the, the day we came home from Israel, we got married in '98, we came back in 2002. Um, we arrived, I think it was like July 2nd. Um, and uh, we ended up in Newark Airport, and we're getting into a taxi, going back to my mom's house, who was living in Queens at the time. And um, she, uh, we're in the taxi, and uh, it's my wife and I, my two kids. And uh, the taxi driver is pouring, and it was raining really hard. The taxi driver is like, hey, where are you coming from? So, um, I'm, like, I'm coming from Israel. He's like, you mean Palestine? <laughs> I'm like, oh boy, it's a long ride. <laughs> You know, so uh, I'm like, you know, no, it's not, you know, Israel back and forth, and this is like after the Intifada, it's the first Intifada, the second Intifada, and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, he's something very terrible to me. He says, you know, well, we all know the Jews control the media, right? You guys control the media. I'm like, no, we control the world. We don't control the media. <laughs> so, says, I said, listen, I'm like, you, how many Muslims are there? He's like, about 1.5 billion. I said, okay, how many Jews are there? He's like, about 450 million. I'm like, you think there are 450 million Jews? He's like, yeah. I'm like, try again, lower. He's like, 300 million, 200 million, 100 million. I'm like, no. I'm like, there's only about 15 million Jews on the planet. He's like, really? He's I'm like, yeah. I'm like, and you think that 15 million Jews control the whole entire planet like anything else? He's like, you know what, listen. So he feels like I got it. He's like, you know what? I don't know about the numbers, but I, I do know this. I know that my kids are going to university. And I want to teach my children to advocate for Palestinians and their rights in the same ways that Jews have been doing for the last 30 years. And you will see that there's going to be a major title change 
in the way in which the world thinks about Palestinians. And that was in 2002. Yeah, I, thank you, Larry. point out, like something you said, I, you know, SGP in 2002. I remember SGP when I was on campus about 10 years ago. Like, you know, I, I spoke with a student. She did a whole thesis, really, in the past year on research and whatnot about how none of what we're seeing is a grassroots movement. Nothing is new. And um, I think our challenge that we always speak about over and over is Jewish people is like we're kind of always in this reactive state to something that has been so deeply embedded and set foundationally. Um, and I think the question is, you know, I think I, you see my frustration in the film when I ask, like, you're telling us to start from zero, and like, we're, you know, because that's how I feel sometimes, but I think the, the, the cool part is, is we have this resilience that was, that was spoken about, and uh, so when I hear that, it's like, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, again, but then I'm reminded, like, there's a reason we're all, like, sitting here, again, saying, no, but what are we going to do about it, so, I just... I want to add one last thing. You know, one of the things that um, we were dealing with on campus, I used to work for the, uh, for the JLIC, the Jewish Organization on Campus, which was a collaboration between the OU and Hillel uh, at the campus. And uh, one of the words that we kept using at Hillel at the time was apathy. How do we combat apathy? Apathetic Jews on campus, Jews that are, you know, have an identity, but like, you know, are likely affiliated, have even more affiliated than so on and so forth. And the truth is that when we saw things like anti-Semitism happening on campus, different things, Jews didn't step up. And it was then as a rabbi that I realized my role was not, wasn't just going to be about teaching Torah to uh, my, my students who you know, come off of uh, you know, high schools and whatnot, or no education or some education, to help, help them rethink about their own Jewish heritage in a way that was meaningful. But it was about giving them the tools to speak about um, you know, Israel and being able to defend Israel and speak about what it means to be a Jew in a uh, cosmopolitan uh, campus in, in New York City. And then my whole role as a, as a, as a, as a uh, campus rabbi changed. I wasn't prepared for that. I don't teach you to go ahead and like, become an advocate for Israel. I'm going to go teach them Gemara, teach them Chumash, we'll go through the stories, show that it's relevant. But to sit there and start talking about 1967, the war, what happened, who won, who lost, a whole different thing. The one common thing that, you know, the one, the one message that I kept pushing for my students, and this is again 2002, was um, if you're unwilling to step up and to understand intellectually what it means to be a Jew, the world around you will rewrite that story and you'll have nothing. And if you're not willing to take ownership over what it means to be a Jew, the world around you will decide what your fate may be. Hi, I'm Ellie Kohanim. Um, in answer to uh, Izzy's question, about uh, my personal experience with anti-Semitism. I would say I think it was my most formative experience with anti-Semitism. I was born in Iran, and uh, I was just a little girl living, I think, a very beautiful life as Jews in Iran during the Shah uh, time, the king of Iran before the 1979 revolution, and then one day we fast forward and there's this radical Islamic revolution. <coughs> And so I was just five years old, I'm just a little girl, and my family realizes it's time for us to pack up and move, and so they didn't even tell the children in case we would let the authorities know. And so one day, you know, we're on an airplane and we arrive in the United States and we become refugees to the United States, we get refugee status, and I have all the blessings and privileges of, of growing up in the United States, I would argue I had, had the American dream. And uh, so, you know, when you come to America, I think, you think, okay, we're in America, we're in the land of the free. We escaped those Islamist mullahs, and, uh, and everything is gonna be great. And I don't think any of us imagined, and I know that everyone in this synagogue and congregation really resonates with this. Uh, most of us, I believe, are connected to the Middle East, and we are all of us maybe one, two, three, four generations away from having fled our ancient homelands in the Middle East. So I think it's shocking for all of us to now wake up and suddenly understand that the same forces that we literally ran away from, me, myself, not that long ago, uh, those same forces are now here in the United States. And in fact, our intelligence agencies are telling us that it is the Islamic Republic of Iran's regime that has funded and organized a lot of this uh, anti-Semitic, anti-Israel campus activity we've been experiencing over the last year. So I do think um, the rude awakening for all of us is that what we ran away from and we thought we found safe harbor 
here in the US, that safe harbor, I am not sure exists any longer. And, uh, and I'm just gonna share one additional thought, which is um, if we are going to stay, and I think that is the big question that came out of this incredible film, and it's a really powerful, moving experience. If we are going to stay in the United States, then let us be clear that we have to fight that the way we were living until now no longer can go on. Things have changed, so we must change. And right now, we are all, I believe, fasting and mourning. It's Tisha B'Av in Israel. For how many days now have we been hearing news sources tell us Iran is about to attack Israel? Iran is attacking Israel. Iran's going to do this to Israel. Iran is going to do that to Israel. And everybody's, you know, all of us are holding our breaths, right? Since October 7th, I think we've all been holding our breaths. And we're waiting for Israel to be attacked by Iran like sitting ducks, right? Right now, we know that when Prime Minister Netanyahu was here, he released a list of arms. I have it on my phone. I can share it with whoever's interested. Mark Levin on Fox News shared it. A list of arms and armaments that the United States is still withholding to this day that Israel needs for resupply right now as they're fighting the seventh front war. So the other message I want to share is if we're going to stay, number one, we have to fight. And if we're going to fight, we also have to make sure that we're fighting for Israel. Because right now, as you and I are, are in this room, Israel is still waiting for armaments and munitions and weapons so that they can fight the self-defensive war. And it's our duty and responsibility if we're going to stay here to make sure that we're also fighting for Israel so that our brothers and, sis and sisters in Israel have what they need. I have uh, many comments just from, from that alone. I, I think um, I'm often put in a place of trying to understand what our role is in the diaspora. Like, what, what is it? And yes, Israel also is in a, a form of diaspora. It's true. We're, we're all still living in exile. But um, it constantly comes back to this question of like, we're not just meant to be here with our really nice lives and beautiful things and, and all of that. So, um, and, I, and one thought I had last night actually is, I don't think it's a mistake, right, that like, you know, I see there's like Hashem has been telling us for weeks or days now, or whatever, really, that this imminent attack is coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. It's almost like we keep getting this wake-up call. We keep getting this like, hey, like there's things happening. Are you doing anything yet? And, and we can't keep just waiting and sitting here until we're going to, again, be reactive to the situation. So really, you said that so eloquently, and, and thank you for that. I, I wanted to ask you, and also, Avia, maybe already, if, I don't know, Ellie, if you have something else you want to add to what you just shared. Um, but, you know, as you heard in the film, like, America es Anders. I'm not fluent in Yiddish by any means, but that was the one phrase I learned from uh, this film. Uh, you know, from what you're sharing, Ellie, is it that different? Given that the influence that we know is here, doesn't seem like so much, but as, you know, two individuals that first-hand experience an Islamic regime and what that was like, and what you're seeing today in the undercurrents, I've had this conversation uh, with my father many, many times in the past few months. I would love to hear from your perspective. Is America different? Is America different? I would say that it's not that different. Um, and let me explain. I don't think we're at the point where we can't do anything to combat this. We need to first take a sobering look at what is going on on the streets right now. We're seeing protests in the thousands, thousand people, hundreds of people on college campuses, but we're still a population of what, 300 million in the United States? They are just extremely loud. And what that's doing is it's causing a lot of kids, older people, to take the path of least resistance. And the path of least resistance is to agree with the loud and strong and the intimidating ones. And so if you're a random college student or high school student that just graduated from South Dakota somewhere and you're entering into Columbia University, you're seeing a pro-Palestinian side that tells you if you even mention the name Israel, you're a genocide supporter, you're evil, and they will shame you to no end. If you, then you look at the pro-Israel side and it's kumbaya and we love everybody, and we believe in pro-Palestinians, and we believe in pro-Israel, and it's a very holistic um, approach. Now, what's happening is they're utilizing the tactics that BLM utilized. 
If you remember back in the day, whether you agreed with them or you didn't agree with them at some point, I would have challenged any business that disagreed with BLM to put a big sign on outside of their window saying, I hate BLM. Nobody would do it because they were too scared and the shame tactics were working. America could become, could, could become no different if we allow them to continue shaming us, shaming our students, and, shame, and really taking hold of the narrative. What makes America different, and what will continue to keep America different, is the rights that we have as Jews in this country today as individuals. The right to speak out, the right to fight back, the right to sue when we're discriminated against. That will keep America different, and most importantly, we, uh, we have to, have to, have to educate our children on what it means to be Jewish, on what it means to, to have the history of Judaism, and not just Hanukkah, right? I mean, really educate them as to what, why Israel is important, and then educate them as to the religion. There's so many students that just don't know anything. I, I've met Israeli kids, the nicest kids. What are you? I'm Buddhist. Why are you Buddhist? I want them to find something spiritual. Have you tried Judaism, right? Like, we're not, we're not educating. If we're saying we're Jews and this is our tribe, then the Torah is our constitution. We need to learn. We need to educate our students and empower them to go on college campuses and say, I am that Jew. Be brave and not allow these individuals to shame other students from not supporting Israel. Thank you. Do you have anything else to add to the to that? In defense of the uh, in defense uh, of the what's it called of the uh, I'm just going to give it up to you in a minute. In defense of the college students on campus, you know uh, many of the students who are dealing with anti-Semitism on campus who are educated, who can combat, are they don't want to because they don't want to get a bad grade, they don't want to get bullied, they don't want to have to deal with you know universities that have uh, you know poor um, uh, policy. And they'd rather just keep quiet and just go to school to get a grade and to get a, get a job instead of actually fight. Yeah, I'll, I'll say actually what was, what was most concerning, um, you know, I, I've been bringing students, we brought 15 students to speak to Knesset in Israel to share about their stories facing anti-Semitism the past few months. And the physical abuse ones are, are scary and, and heart-wrenching, but actually the latent anti-Semitism situations like you're speaking about, and I've found cousins and family members that are afraid to go to a teacher to speak about a paper because if they do and they bring up their real opinions, they won't get a good grade. I mean, that is actually more scary because it's so deeply embedded and entrenched in the culture of society right now. Um, I wanted to ask Joe, actually, as, as someone who um, you know endeavored on going to share the truth, to really try and shift the narrative, to bring out you know, what, what happens, and having also been, if I'm not mistaken, in Israel on October 7th and for a few weeks after, you saw things with your own eyes and all you were trying to do was bring out that truth and that reality. How do you keep going forward in fighting this narrative war, quote unquote, um, given all of the pushback that, you know, obviously we all saw publicly and I'm sure behind closed doors you, you also faced? Um, yeah, so I mean, the, the quick origination story of the exhibit is I was in um, Israel uh, Fog, uh, some meetings that were with tech, um, and uh, spent obviously a course in a bomb shelter, and then on the uh, 8th, 9th, 10th, you know, the days following, ditched a few flights home uh, to my family's uh, disappointment, and uh, spent some time on a hotel ambulance. And I was basically just terrified with my bulletproof vest, shopping for various materials in an empty Jerusalem, uh, and FaceTiming every Jew of influence that I felt uh, needed to see what was happening from my FaceTime, you know, first person perspective. And they could see my face, they could see my fear. Um, I was really trembling on some of the calls. Um, and uh, when I did finally return home, a few of those uh, individuals asked me if I would take as if I was like some tour guide um, to Israel to see what I had seen those days. And we did a trip in November, we did a trip in December. Um, and um, on one of those trips, I was privileged to go uh, with my dear friend Yanine, who's here, and uh, Scooter, uh, Scooter Braun, who's a, a, you know, a famous music producer. And we did all of the things, like you know, barbecue on the bases, and visiting injured in hospitals, and the hostage families. And then someone suggested that we go to uh, an exhibit that they had in Tel Aviv uh, 
about Bonobo Music Festival. And in the beginning, I was a little bit hesitant. Um, it was a packed schedule. To be totally transparent, I didn't necessarily see like the point of going to an exhibit in Tel Aviv about a festival that we had actually been to the site of, we had actually seen the, uh, the kibbutzim. And, but you know, people insisted, so we went. And when I saw the faces of the average Israeli when they touched a car that was impacted by an RPG at the festival, where they put their hands on the porta potties that were littered with AK-47 uh, bullets uh, that multiple you know kids were, were killed in, um, and I saw their face, you know, go white. I realized that the average Israeli didn't have the opportunity to see what had transpired in the south, and as an American, I had gone straight there. Um, and there was something important to telling the story in person. And you know, Scooter opens his mouth and says, "What would it take to bring this to New York?" And you know, Los Angeles, Miami, where, wherever. Um, and I don't think we realized what we were signing up for. None of us did. The Nova founder certainly didn't. Um, and uh, we opened in New York. I think 113,000 people um, went to the exhibit. Um, <laughs> Sunday uh, in Culver City, uh, an even bigger space, hopefully you can accommodate even more people. Uh, if you have any friends on the West Coast, please send them our way. Um, but I think that the narrative that, uh, that we had deliberately chosen um, was it's a strictly, there's, there's no, you can critique it, but there's no Israeli flag in the exhibit. It's not about Israel. It's about the largest massacre in music history. And of course, through the testimonies, it comes out that this was a, a massacre of, of Jews and Israelis and those that were celebrating life at the festival. And um, one of the things that I thought think is really special about that is that it insulated it from a lot of the um, the parallels that people draw to the war. And when the protest, the violent protest, did break out that last week of the exhibit, first of all, as Jews, we responded in the only way we should, which is extending the exhibit by a week, despite the fact that it cost us another million dollars. Um, But second of all, what you saw that I think is so fascinating, I'm not like a big news and politics person, but you saw for the first time those on the left were forced to condemn. Why? Because this was a protest outside of a memorial to a massacre at a music festival. And you saw AOC tweet against it, you saw you know, countless publications that had been silent on the issues finally uh, have to show, their, show the face of what these protests really are. And um, I think it was actually that and a few other moments in New York that turned the tide I don't, and I think there genuinely is less patience right now in the general public for these protests, and I think that was a seminal moment for that. Um, and the last thing I'll just say is the, the tagline of the Nova exhibit, um, and you know, the, the memorial is, we will dance again. I have two bracelets, and I'll thank you, Hashem, and we will dance again. Um, and I think that's a stark difference from you know, the, uh, the, the slogan that we have for the, for the Holocaust, which was never again, right? Never again is saying never again to the atrocities. We spoke in the, in the in the film about you know perhaps not to you know with disrespect we focus so much on the atrocities on the death that we miss out on the life that these people lived with. We will dance again as saying that not never again to the atrocities, but we will dance again yes again to the celebration, yes again to the inspiration, yes again to the values that that uh, the people that lost their lives lived with, and and we will dance again. Thank you. Um, Rabbi, we spoke briefly uh, yesterday and uh, you shared a bit about the way you see the world from this more rational perspective. And I said that I need a little dose of that. I think my parents would agree. Um, but that uh, from a rational perspective that the golden age of Jewish influence is dwindling. Can you, can you speak to that a bit? <laughs> yeah. Um... We are, we're, the people that are in this room are, are very fortunate that uh, America has been an amazing place for us as Jews. Um, but when we look at um, what I was, uh, one of the things that we were dealing with on campus in 2002 was trying to stop and stem the tides of assimilation. And uh, this is in 2002, we knew that the assimilation rate in America back then was at 49.5%, close to 50%, which meant that in uh, another generation, 50% of the Jews on campus 
depending on where you are, or children are coming from uh, mixed marriages. Um, and that uh, the number today in 2024, and the assimilation rate in America is closer to 78%. Uh, um, and the number is growing. Um, and um, what that means is that Jews uh, who are coming from those types of mixed marriages identify less with Judaism than Jews. Um, and therefore, you have less people advocating for Jews. Um, imagine currently the Jewish population in America is approximately 5 million. And about 30 years from now, uh, the number will drop to about 2.5 million. Right? So less influence. Um, and as that influence drops, you'll see that Jews have less ability of advocating and pushing and so on and so forth. Um, and I, when I said to you, you know, uh, yesterday, is that you know, while uh, so much is happening in Israel, and of course we do everything in our hearts to, to protect Israel, we have a responsibility to do what we can to save our brothers and sisters here. Um, and therefore, you know, outreach and the programs that we run at Hazak and other organizations around the world, this is, this is what we do all day. Uh, we think that this is like paramount, super important. But what I did say to you like this is that for me, in America, we're safe as long as there's two things that are always in place. Number one is the Second Amendment. I think it's super important to have the right to defend yourself. Uh, it's harder to do it in New York City, and uh, but you know, I moved out to Long Island, and the first thing I did was I went to the store, <laughs> and um, I. Um, uh, the, second, uh, and the Second Amendment, I believe, is super important because the Second Amendment is what helps protect the First Amendment. And as long as we have a First Amendment, freedom of speech, okay, as Jews, it doesn't matter how big or small the community is, you have the right to get to state your opinion. Um, and for me, uh, while uh, you know, the world is burning and falling apart around us, because it's not just about the Israel-Palestinian conflict. See, there's a perfect storm that's burning right now. It's, we're watching the basic core of American values being eviscerated right now. What does it mean to be an American? What does it mean to be a Western? And you see this, uh, this, this um, identity issue, this crisis of identity happening about the whole of the West. It's happening in London, it's happening in France, it's happening in all of Europe. What does it mean to be a Westerner today? What does it mean to have Western values? As Jews, it's interesting that we're able to maintain this very deep connection to our faith, having a very deep religious identity and still somehow have this connection to Western values, because in many ways, Western values are very much uh, overlaid over Jew Jewish values. So while that is clear, and what's happening in the, in the far left, what's happening with uh, you know, many of the, uh, the radical uh, Islamic groups is that there's this, this uh, coalition that's happening where let's get rid of these uh, old school now I, you know, uh, beliefs and ideals, and let's create a new reality. Um, to be Jewish means to be uh, able to articulate clearly what, what, what you're living for. What's your mission? What's our goal? We've been duped into thinking in the West that we're only here to do one thing, and that's make money. And while money is important, and education is super important, but most parents send their kids to good universities because they want them to get a good job, not because they want them to think critically. And because we didn't demand critical thinking from our children, in those universities. Universities said, well, it's not really about thinking, it's about getting them jobs, so why teach them how to think? Let's teach them how to get jobs. And as we stop thinking as Americans, all kinds of foreign ideas have settled in and have radicalized so much what's happening on campus. So I see all of this as an awakening for all of us, as Jews, as parents, as community members, I we have to get back to the core of what it is to be a Jew. To be a Jew at its core means to think, means to know, means to understand, means to wrestle, means to grapple, means to never stop. There's no resting to be a Jew. So while things are changing, I see this all as a unique opportunity to stand up and double down on what it means to be a Jew and spend more time on figuring out how we can advocate, explore, express our values to the world around us, to protect it from the craziness that we're seeing in the world today. Yeah, you, you eloquently said uh, that as Jews, we often forget that we're strangers in a strange land. And I think we can interpret that in two ways. One, that we're in exile and we're not in our homeland, and two, that we take on the values of where we are, of this strange place, and we think that that is the norm. And we have to remind ourselves, and often the world around us does it for us, that we are different. Um, you know, I, I commented in the film that sometimes I have to think about wearing my star in or out, 
And I really, really hope to show that it'll never be a time where I feel like I genuinely have to put it in. Because right now I wear it and I hope people see it. And I hope they know that I'm a Jew. And I, and I used to think, you know, even though I dress more modestly, you know, people don't know I'm a Jew. And I didn't like that. I want people to know who I am and what I stand for. And I think it, it really is upon us as, you know, as much as we can to, to hold on to that and bring that out. So thank you, Rabbi. Um, Elia, yeah, but a little bit of a two-part question, but you have been in the space of combating anti-Semitism probably longer, you know, than most of us in this room, definitely than myself. So are you surprised by what's happening today, or did you kind of see this coming? And as a part two, do you find that there's still room for dialogue, for conversation, hope for this fight, you know, that we're, we're reflecting on here um, in the political sphere in, in particular? Um, in terms of, of, uh, of this being a new phenomenon, um, absolutely not. I think uh, anyone who has been, who's ever looked at the FBI hate crime statistics, um, what you'll find for many years now, um, I, I mean at least 20 years, is that the, uh, the Jews are the greatest victims of hate crimes by religion in the United States of any ethnic or religious group. And every year we're seeing a year over year increase. And so if you look at that as a graph, that means that the graph was always charting upwards, unfortunately. It was going upwards for at least 20 years or so, um, the last time I looked at this. so. Um, so for many years now, we knew that there was growing anti-Semitism in the United States. Um, and, and I think many of us had been warning about it, and we were talking about um, another, another growing concern is, is what's called the Red-Green Alliance, the uh, alliance between the radical left and radical Islam in the United States. And for many years, we've had voices, even in the Jewish community, tell us, no, 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 it's white supremacists. You have to worry about the white supremacists. They're the greatest threat to Jews. And we kept seeing those trend lines and saying, no, you know what? I think this alliance between the radical left and the radical Islamists is really where the threat is coming at, at us. And, uh, and I think that you know, if there's one point of clarity that the campus uh, explosion of hatred against Jews has made clear for us is that, in fact, it is that radical Islamist, radical leftist alliance that, uh, that today is uh, causing Paul Kessler in Los Angeles, a Jewish man who was left dead after uh, a Palestinian professor, a pro-Palestinian professor actually uh, slammed him in the head with, um, with a megaphone. And this weekend we all know that a Jewish man in Crown Heights was stabbed as the, as the perpetrator was shouting at him, free Palestine. So I think that um, a lot of what has been worrying for us, a lot of trends that we've been seeing have come to fruition post-October 7th in the worst way. And um, in terms of is there still room for us to fight back, um, one observation I'm going to share here is that if you look at what happened with, um, you know, literally I think your, your film showed very well that it was like October 8th. It was the, in the United States, the news of the attack of October 7th with Shabbat, as you all remember, was filtering in in the afternoon. It literally felt like by that time, by, by evening US New York time, there was already pro-Hamas protests taking place across the country. But certainly by October 8th, we started to see this movement across the country. If you're, the question about, you know, can we fight this back? So we saw this, this uh, pro Hamas movement take place all across the country, across the world, and it seemed like it was just getting worse and worse, it was building and building, and nothing was happening. I would argue that if you notice in UCLA, when the Israeli and Persian kids went to campus and they fought back, that became a turning point. Now, it might be slightly controversial to say this, but I am convinced that when those kids went to UCLA and they fought back against the pro Hamas uh, mobs, it became a turning point. And after that is when we start to see what they call the frat boys, right? The fraternity boys on the campuses in parts of the country where there's hardly any Jews or no Jews. Um, they started to defend the American flag. 
That took place after those kids in UCLA, the Israeli and Persian kids fought back. Then we see the frat boys. And then we start to see more and more people um, you know, start to push back and counter protest. And I think find their strength, find their bravery and their courage. So um, I am convinced that we can fight. And, and, and I'm going to say it again. I think a big question is that your film raises is can we continue to live here in the United States? Are we still safe? Can, is, this, is, is America different or is America just like everywhere else we ever were? And I'm not going to necessarily tell everybody what I think you should do, but what I will say is as follows. If we're going to stay in the United States, I don't think it's any longer a question. There's, no, there's nothing to debate. We have to fight. They're, they're coming after us, right? There's a man in Crown Heights who was stabbed. We have to fight. So, um, but I do think that when we do fight, we are inspirational. And we also show the rest of this country that Jews are not victims, and they don't have to feel bad for us, that we will defend ourselves, that we'll fight for ourselves. And, uh, and that, that, I think, is, is the winning image is always the, the best image you want to put forward. We don't want to be Woody Allen Jews. We want to be strong Jews. The same kind of soldiers that you see in Israel, we need to be those soldiers here in America, perhaps not wearing uniform. Very, very well said. And, and I'll say one, one anecdote about uh, Chayalim and us here, because I feel like that's a phrase that I've been hearing a lot since October 7th. We have to also be soldiers here, we have these soldiers here. And sometimes you hear it and you're like, I know especially, I mean, maybe it's a little bit more for the men than the women, like, no, but I should be in the battlefield. That is, you know, like, it's not the same. I'm not really giving, giving enough of myself. And um, I've experienced a lot of really interesting interactions between Israelis who are serving and students here uh, who are, quote, unquote, fighting their fight here. And the Israelis, verbatim, like these are commanders in the IDF, looked at our students in the eye and said, I don't know if I could do what you're doing. I don't know if I could walk around the college campus and be a proud Jew and wear an Israeli flag on my back and speak out for, for the Jewish people. So it is real, it is a real battle, it is a real fight, no fight is less than the other. I, I don't mean to diminish at all what is happening in Israel, we all have to continue to dive in and put our hearts toward there, that is our home, whatever that means, however you want to define that. But at the end of the day, we're here, There's, there has to be um, a reason that there are still five million, six million Jews outside of Israel. And until the day, you know, if you can go there and make a life there, I'm the first one to say, go and do it. I, I, you know, but if you can't, and you have real valid reasons why you can't, so, so make your purpose here felt and, and do something with that. Um, so I think time is kind of ticking. And if we have time to open it up to the crowd, we can, we can do that. I just wanted to give everyone um, a chance to share one more piece and just kind of in this vein of, of what you hit on, Ellie. Um, you know, much of the sentiment of the interviewees we were surprised, right? The question was, are we guests? And we thought a few people would say, yes, straight out, we're guests, you know, other than really Hill Fold who you had on there who, uh, you know, it, it, it's a question though, right? But most people said we're not, we're not guests, at least not yet. So, but they said if we're, if we're not careful, we will become guests. So from your vantage point, and, and Joe, we can start with you and we'll, we'll come down the line. Um, what more, you know, that you haven't maybe shared yet uh, is there left for us to do? Or, or I guess another way I want to ask that is, what's the antidote to dealing with everything that's happening right now? Um, I don't know the name of the panel. Um, I, 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 for work last week, I had to go to the West Coast for a conference, and I, I sold my little startup to a big uh, public company, and one of the uh, executives, uh, he's from Atlanta, and we're going for a walk, and he says to me, he's like, Joe, I'm, I'm eating my food out of like a tin foil container, and everyone else has like a private chef. So he knows that I have a coupon, he knows who I am. And um, he says, Joe, I have a question for you. How do you notice, you know, I'm Episcopal, but since October 7th, so many uh, of my Jewish friends are becoming much more Jewish. So what do you mean? He said, I have a friend that lived with in college. He was the farthest from an observant Jew I've ever met. And all of a sudden, this Friday night, we invited him and his wife to come over. And he said, no, I have to go to, uh, go to services. And I said, I said, really? And I said, 
I said how emotional, I told him how emotional it was for me to hear that from him. And I think part of that is because, uh, it's funny, the, the phrase, I'm, I'm not good at Yiddish, but American Andres. No, it's not the first, you know, I'd heard it in a different context. Um, there's a story of the, uh, the Friediger, the previous, um, the Babacher Rezi, when he came off the boat in America, he immediately instructs the Hasidim that come to the port, I guess, I think he arrived in New York and said, you know, we have to open a mikvah, we have, I need 10 guys to go to yeshiva here before I'm even going to step foot in Brooklyn, we need to do uh, this, you know, bigger follow needs to be set up, this, and the Hasidim looked at him, and he's wearing his, you know, guard from Europe, and they looked at him, they said, Rabbi, America is dangerous, America is different, right? And he said, he looked him back in a defiant way, he says, America is nish dangerous, right? And that's the famous line, America is no different. And when he was saying America is no different, he wasn't saying that we're guests here, we're not guests here, what he was saying is that the traditions and the institutions and the values that we as a faith have kept us for so many thousands of years, the mikvah that he was asking for, the yeshiva he was asking for, the the, the that he was asking for, are the exact same things that have, you know, stood the test of time and will keep us and are the antidote in many ways. And, you know, the Chabad's philosophy, and I think it sounds like everyone's philosophy here that I've learned and has really resonated with me on anti-Semitism, and I've spoken with the rabbi on this, is that it's time for offense and not defense, and that Jewish pride is the antidote. And you spoke about in the candy shop when your mom said to say, he says you're Jewish, or he calls you a Jew, you say yes, and I'm proud. That is the antidote to what we're facing today on campus. It's the antidote to what we're facing in the workplace. It's the antidote to what we're facing in politics. Um, and the more that we can all you know, strengthen our, our Jewish pride intellectually, spiritually, in our own lives, and in, in the communities we're part of, and then push that outwards, I think the, uh, the stronger we'll be. I don't think we're guests, but I think it's it's time we stop acting like guests. Yeah. And what that really means is that we shouldn't censor ourselves. Um, we should stick to the truth and stick to the admit and be proud of ourselves. So too often I hear people very uncomfortable about talking about East Jerusalem or Hebron, and they start getting very squeamish. No. We know our history there. Speak of it as the truth. We are all fasting tonight because of a temple that was destroyed in Jerusalem. There's no shame. We need to wear that with pride and be strong and forceful about it. Um, I went to, uh, last week I was speaking in front of Nassau County uh, legislators, the legislative chamber. It was our bill for Masi Philippe. It was a, a bill for Masi Philippe against mask, it was called the Mask Transparency Act, which was supposed to um, ban masks and public protests, etc. The people that came to oppose the masks, each and every single one of them, came up to discuss how it may affect marginalized communities, the brown and the black marginalized communities. But this may affect marginalized communities. What struck me is, and I saw this in the video, and there's a lot of play in this, is are we victims? Have we been oppressed? Or are we the oppressors? And we don't like to be victims. We Jews are not victims, but we must never allow them to forget that they have victimized us. Despite the victimization that we were subjected to, we stood tall with our resilience and made ourselves something. At the end of the day, if anybody comes up like, but this is gonna affect another group. Our group was very effective. We were very impressed, we were very marginalized, but we are resilient. We wore our pride on our shoulder, on our sleeves. We believe in our Judaism, we believe in our history, and our identity, and as long as we can walk proudly, as if we are not guests in this country, I think things will change. God willing, because that's true. I, I, I think, you know, for me, my, my perspective is one that's based on history. I, I feel like we are guests here. Uh, and that doesn't mean that we should behave like guests here. And historically speaking, you know, we've been exiled since 1,956 years since the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed. We visited uh, most of the uh, beautiful places on the planet. We were very instrumental in helping build and develop those societies. And after hundreds of years, we were, for whatever reason, forced to leave. Um, and because I am a student of uh, Torah, theology, I would have to say that spiritual, for spiritual reasons, I believe, 
that you know if you think that we're going to be in America forever, you're making a mistake. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't uh, defend, fight, articulate, and stand up like you know uh, we just heard force me at that responsibility. Uh, but uh, but I think it comes with a uh, sense of humility. At the end of the day, we are visitors because ultimately you know. It's hard to feel like you're going to be here for a long time when we spend three times a day in this building asking for God to rebuild the Beit Midash, to take us back to Jerusalem, to see the end of suffering, to bring the Gedula. All that is going to happen, God willing, Bezat Hashem, soon. It's going to happen in Israel. That's going to be the place where it's all going to happen. And maybe all this, this whole tension, the whole trauma that's unfolding right now, just a way for us to kind of like wake up a little bit. And say, you know what, I want to be a part of that process. I'm not saying you should get to go. I'm not, I'm not leaving. You know, but I am saying that it's time for us to wake up inside. So hope at the end of the day, when, I, when, God, when we talk about the Mikdash, the Mikdash that matters the most is not the building that was destroyed. God said, Mikdash God says, make, you want to make a holy place? No problem. Make it, and I will dwell within you. To be a Jew means to create a space for God inside of ourselves. I think that, that, that that's exactly what anti-Semitism is supposed to do for us, our history. It's there to wake us up, to create a space within ourselves to allow something divine to settle in. And in that, God willing, we'll see all that great thing, all those amazing things that you will happen in this Should we get out of this better? Yes. Better. Yes. Better. 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 Since these are, I think, the closing remarks, I, I also just uh, would be remiss if I didn't mention um, how much this building means to me. We had my middle son's bar mitzvah in this sanctuary, so I want to thank Rabbi Farhi for uh, hosting this. Um, <coughs> yeah. Without a doubt, we need to have Jewish pride. And uh, and also, I wanted to stress unity. We heard that message also in the film. Um, we can't forget, unfortunately, how in Israel, uh, Israeli society was, people were tearing each other apart. The society was tearing itself apart right before we got attacked on October 7th. So um, we need pride, we need unity. And, uh, and I do think also, especially in this synagogue, in this congregation, we can resonate with also reclaiming our ancient heritage and our connection to Israel, and not forgetting that we're indigenous to the Middle East. And so any accusation of apartheid and colonializer is such a joke when uh, somebody says it to someone from Syria or Lebanon or, or uh, Afghanistan or Bukharia or Iran, you know, we go up and down the, the list and the places where we lived before the uh, advent of Islam, right? Before Islam came and conquered these lands, we were living there. So let's never forget also that we are the ancient indigenous people of Israel. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. I, I'll just uh, make one last comment to the unity piece because uh, anytime I have a mic or people listening, I, I give this plug. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know if it's that we were just so enthralled by the moment that we didn't realize, but how many people here were at the march in DC in, in November? Okay, a good number of you. And did you see at any point any pro-Palestinian flag or riot or protest or that was the most organized. Okay, so we have the rational approach because it was very organized and there was a lot of security and we had and we did. And there was amazing police there and you know there's the famous comment the police said they didn't get that many thank yous in their lifetime as they did in that one day. So yes, there is all of that. But what I see from like a spiritual place and from a place of unity and strength is that when the Jews come together, there's three hundred thousand Jews standing there of every background, every color, every race, you name it. Our enemies don't have a chance, and they know that, whether it's conscious or subconscious. So we have to continue to hold on to that and don't lose it, and, and, and wherever we can, really come together. It's not a cheesy thing, Achtu, right? We got the Torah because we were like one person with one heart. So the same way that we're going to live eternally and, and have this future is going to be being like one person with one heart. So I just wanted to, to share that as a, as a parting message. I don't think we have time for more questions. Basically, Mincha time. No. Until 7.30, so we have about five minutes. Oh, yeah? Okay.
Okay. Just before that happens, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, they thank, she thanked all the panelists. I just want to say thank you to everybody. The later it gets on Tisha B'Av, the harder it is to actually be up here and speak and perform. So I want to thank all the panelists for coming out and really spending time with us. Riva and, and Maurice. Yes, and as well, and, uh, in, in producing this amazing film, Marcia as well, and uh, Martin as uh, Maurice as well for coming out. It's very, very special. We all enjoyed so much. Let's take a couple of questions before we go to Mika. Okay. And also, just one last thank you. I want to take questions. Just thank you to the Safra community here, and Rabbi Kari, and Rabbi Kari. Yes. You should know. I've never been behind the scenes on what goes into planning one of these days, but it's not like a it's not like a two second process. They think about this for weeks. Obviously, they hope that the day doesn't have to come, but here it is, and they always execute it so amazingly with so much thought. So thank you for all that you put into this. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll speak loud. <laughs> so, Izzy, congratulations on the film. It was amazing. Um, one thing that struck me was the the band student who said that. Nobody wants to talk to her about being Jewish and about her perspective. And I live downtown. I walk through Washington Square Park every single day on my way home from work. I can't tell you how many white kids I see in Kavias. And I wear all my dog tags and my star. And like once in a while, I just happen to have an Israeli flag on my back. And I, I do try to engage in respectful dialogue, but nobody wants to talk to me. Nobody wants to hear it. So. Do any of you have ideas about that? Silence. Yeah. Buy a megaphone. <laughs> well, actually, you should know. So the Bingaman student, Logan, we speak with quite often, she has a megaphone, and she went by herself to the encampments and screamed on the top of her lungs. And one thing, this came up actually a few months over Pesach, was with a group, and they were speaking about all the anti-Semitism as everything was erupting on campus. And you know, everyone was talking about like the college kids as like, what, you know, how to, like there, them, like it was like very distant. And I was like, I was like, they need us to come into the room with them. Like she stands with a megaphone by herself because the Jewish students on campus are telling her to be quiet and they're too afraid to go. So regardless of the fact that it, it's a twofold thing that came to mind when you asked that question, yes, A, how do we actually, and if anyone here has ideas as to how, get people to engage with the dialogue, and B, how do we, you know, encourage or be there for our, our students. And, you know, one, the SGP movement, by the way, has faculty behind it and has community behind it. They don't go out to protest by themselves. They are there with people in their mid-50s. So when we see things happening on campus, we need to show up. That's gonna to continue to be the, the foreground of everything that's happening, and they need a community behind them because these kids that you're seeing up there, those few brave individuals and brave voices, they are completely alone in this fight. They really are, and it's really painful, and it's really challenging. So we need to realize that we are part of that story. And you know, I was gonna just joke like you're not even a college student; you're walking around with an Israeli flag on your back. Like, good for you. Like, that's amazing. And that's not everyone's role and job. But to think how we can put ourselves in their shoes and be there for them, I think is uh, is part of it. Okay. Yeah. I'll ask it. Go. Yeah. Um, hi. You, I guys were all great and so thoughtful. We learned so much, and thank you so much for your film. But I have a question for the rabbi. Um, you talked about trying to educate some of these Jewish students on campuses. And as we know statistically, that's way too late. Um, and I don't understand why the Jewish community, with all the resources we have, is not opening up yeshivas for people that either can't afford or even don't want to pay. Mm. I grew up where there was a teacher strike for three months. And our yeshiva in my neighborhood <coughs> opened up to the whole neighborhood and people paid whatever they can or didn't even pay. Until this day, which was over 50 years ago, some of those people that were raised in non-religious homes are religious today. And I don't understand why the community is <coughs> You have to be mindful of the fact that um, I saw the statistic um, about 15 years ago in the UJA. 93% um, of all Jewish charity dollars does not go to the Jewish community. Okay, that means only about 7% of charity that's given by Jews ends up in the Jewish community. So while you know you come from a very affluent group of Jews, um, an overwhelming majority of them are not supporting. Now that's changing. You saw that, like post October 7th, you had Robert Kraft, 
at Columbia saying, I'm from where will be my money, and all these you know, uh, endowments are going to Harvard University and other big universities, and it's changing a little bit. Why you is picking a lot of that up. Why you is packed and stern packed. There are kids sitting on the floor because there's not enough space, there's no desks for these kids. Um, so it's changing, it just, it just takes time. We're gonna get there, I think we are gonna get there. I think we are gonna see the change that you're describing. And um, confidence and happens. And, and, and I'll, one, one thing I will say is I disagree with that it's too late. College is not too late to educate a kid. Um, it's never too late. Right, I'm just saying, but I'm saying I think that, that I think that unfortunately, you know, if for, for a lot of these kids that go to Yeshiva, uh, they, they grew up in such insular communities that they don't really understand how to engage with a non Jewish world and on, on campus where they're in that secular environment where they're finally in a place where they can really understand what it means to have that dialogue. I think that's the best place to do it. They might not be ready for it in high school. Okay, I think we're gonna take one more. Go ahead. Uh, last time I looked at the statistics of how many colleges have protests and how many don't, it was something like two, three, four, five percent of the colleges were having protests against Jews pro and pro Hamas, and it was just the opposite. When I went to visit my daughter at uh, FIT, there was no protest going on. When I was at LIU, there was no protest. When I went to my, one of my alma maters, Stony Brook University, the Jews and the Muslims were having good dialogue. There was people, angry, but there was dialogue. So if the percentages really are 94, 95, 96% are not having protests and colleges are under control, and we know that the media does, and I know there's a problem, don't get me wrong, I'm not delusional, I know and I'm with everything you, you all said, I'm not delusional, but if, if, the tr if we know that the media is blowing stuff up, we know that there's money, when you talk hate, hate, hate against Jews, you get more money for fundraising, as Dennis Prager and Madison Friedman said, what do we do about the pro-positive good stuff going on in the world, and why we don't focus more on that, we focus on the stuff that's gonna get fundraising for Jewish causes. So please, I'm pro everything you've said, so please don't jump down my throat. <laughs> God bless you. you want to take that? So, just to, just to answer a little bit on this. Um, sorry, my mind is blanking left and right. <laughs> the food or the water all day. But I'm just trying to remember your question. <laughs> Shining the light, I think. Like, could we, is there good stuff that we could be. Uh, so, yes. Um, I, now I do remember your question. Is it saying the world hates us, the world hates us? Yes, it's yes. Not true. It's not true. So, so I completely get your question. That's exactly how I opened, right? I, I think there's a, not an exaggeration, because it actually exists, the, the threat is here. But what you're seeing displayed in these protests, what you're seeing displayed on college campuses, isn't the educational process. It's the show-off process, right? It's like, look at the encouragement we have. Now they have media who's in coordination with them, blowing them up, making them as more popular than they are. But the effect that that's having is that your random American today on the street is no longer comfortable in having this conversation. And when they're no longer comfortable in having this conversation, then the next day they can push them a little further and a little further. So we need to focus on this negative to showcase their hatred, to, sh to shame people from joining them, we need to we need to attack that angle, and by doing that, we need to do it by showing who we are and what we are in living as Jews. But it doesn't mean to ignore them and say, "Oh, they're not a big problem." We know, we've ignored them for many years. They have festered to this point. This did not happen overnight. This is very orchestrated. Look at the in camps, the encampments, the tents. This is a showcase of how far they got. This isn't the education. So it is on us to shame them back into the corner. Because if we don't, they're just going to get louder and shame more people, and we're going to continue losing. But we also need to walk with our Jewish pride. That's I, have yeah. I, have, I have one more quick, quick response to that. Um, I am actually co-chairing the National Task Force to Combat Anti-Semitism. It's a coalition of 90 plus organizations, think tanks, and individuals. Most of them are Christian. And so I want to just share that as, you know, we're looking for some good news. The good news is I work very closely with evangelicals. They love Israel. They love the Jewish people. We have real friends and partners in this country. And uh, so if anybody wants to hear more about this coalition, we'd love more uh, Jewish partners in it. And, uh, and also if you follow me on social media, at Ellie Kohanim, Kohanim with a C, um, all of this stuff is also available there.
I just thought as quickly as I'm not happening up there right there now. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I can't answer very quickly. I would just say that uh, the reason why it's a uh, it's just small percentage of campuses is simply because um, there are so many there are so few Jews on campuses. Um, you know, there's only a five five Jews only take up about five percent of the campus major campuses in the United States. You're not seeing those campuses. There's no Jews there, so they don't care. The issues are happening on campus. And by the way, at LIU and at Stony Brook and at FIT, there were protests. I was there. So there were protests on those campuses. Not sure there were no protests. And maybe there's a poor dialogue, depending on the administration. But when administrations have gone woke, which is unfortunately true for so many of the administrations, that's where the issues are coming from, that, that coalition of the red and green. Anyway, I have to run. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.